Yes, yeah, so uh, great to be back in Berlin. I think it was 2017 when I was first uh, had a talk at the Berlin Buzzword, and it's still awesome. So great to see you all, all here. Today we're going to talk about Apache Iceberg, the table format. Uh, but first, a word about me. My name is Fokko Driesprong. I'm an open source engineer at Tabular. So I help people in the open source. I help like uh, triaging uh, bugs. I help like with uh, a development roadmap, like uh, doing examples for people. Uh, guiding like the, the project itself. Uh, Tabular is a company that also yeah, brings uh, Iceberg as a managed service. It makes Iceberg easy is what we say, but enough about Tabular. My GitHub handle is Foco. I'm a committer on Avro Parquet, the file format. Uh, Iceberg, the table format. Apache Airflow, like I explained, like the orchestration engine. And Apache Druid, which is like a columnar store and did a lot of work there on the Parquet uh, batch ingest. So if any any Pending PRs, this is my GitHub handle, ping me, I will help you. If you have any questions about uh, uh, Tabular or Iceberg or whatever, uh, this is my email address. And also, please uh, check the community link of Iceberg, uh, open source uh, Slack channel where a lot of people are willing to help. I'm also jumping in. The big question, right? What is Iceberg? I think that's a lot of pe people struggle with. Um, it's a very abstract concept. What is a table format? Why do we need it? So in this talk, I'm hoping to explain it to you. I think the best definition that we have today is like Iceberg is an open standard. Uh, Iceberg itself, it's not an implementation. It's not code. It's like a specification that's just available on the, on the GitHub. It gets updated every uh, couple of weeks uh, with new features, with uh, improvements in there. Uh, it's for tables with SQL behavior, and this is very important. So uh, when we go back in time with MapReduce and with Hive, we just had like this thing of like we need to process like a lot of data. So we had this notion of distributed file systems and had let go a lot of the of the constraints, right? So um, if you would like add like files in there that were not compatible, you would notice when you started to read those files, which is not very nice for your consumers of the data. Uh, so with Iceberg, we actually try to bring back this behavior. So uh, an iceberg table is like an iceberg on a distributed storage, for example, S3 or ADFS, and it acts like as any other SQL table. Um, it started at Netflix before 2018, then it became open source, but it actually tried to solve like three main things. Uh, first of all, is data engineering productivity. They noticed at Netflix that a lot of data engineers that yeah, we're working on this, uh, of babysitting these, these petabyte-sized tables, um, compacting files, because if you have uh, many small files, AGFS doesn't like it, but also object stores, a lot of overhead. Sometimes some PII data was found in there, so I had to clean it up, and it was like, custom. it took a lot of effort. Uh, custom performance. Um, if you have petabyte-sized tables in the cloud, yeah, the number uh, becomes big also when you spend uh, cost on S3, both like storage costs, but also uh, retrieval cost and these kind of things. And the last and most important one, I think, is correctness. Uh, if you have like a big table where a lot of people are writing and reading from, correctness is a big thing. Uh, sometimes, especially if you have distributed systems, a job can fail. Uh, it might have written like some files, but not all of them, and you get like a table in an inconsistent state. And Iceberg actually yeah, puts like an acid layer on top of this uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if there's like a conflict that you get explicitly notified that something is wrong and you can retry the operation. It's a part of the software, Apache Software Foundation. So um, uh, yeah, it's fully open source. Everything is Apache, Apache 2 licensed. Also the roadmap and everything. It's, it's not only that the code is open, but it's also like every company that uses Iceberg is also contributing back and also influencing the development roadmap. Uh, so there's not one company that actually defines like how Iceberg is evolving, but it's like from all of us. Where does it fit in from the data architecture standpoint? So it's actually a layer in between the storage and the actual compute. Uh, so below we see the object storage, but also AGFS is supported. Uh, we see Iceberg in between that actually lives on top of the cloud storage. And then on top of there we have the compute engines. So this, I had to mention Apache Flink here in Berlin, of course, but uh, we have a, like a wide range of um, of query engine that can just uh, plug into the iceberg uh, data. One very important concept is the catalog. The catalog is the, is the central place where all the tables are being registered. So if you, uh, 
you don't want to have like all your tables spread around uh, across uh, the S3 uh, bucket. So the catalog is the main place where you can find them, and also helps us with uh, with consistency. Um, this is just like a very small list of all the technologies that support it. As you can see, there's like both a lot of open source engines, but also a lot of proprietary engines, for example by AWS, uh, that have native support for uh, for Apache Iceberg. I think also BigQuery here. I'm missing that. I need to update this like every couple of weeks because more people are integrating with it every day. And it's also better scale tested. Like a lot of big companies use like Iceberg at like a very very large uh, scale. Um, yeah, that also shows that it's it's uh, like ready for the industry. These are my uh, sales slides. So let's get more into technical stuff. We're in Berlin buzzwords, of course. So why do we need it, right? So as an engineer, why do I want to uh, get into uh, into Iceberg? I think the most important one I also said, like it's it's asset compliant. It provides like isolation between like different jobs that are reading and writing. Um, like if someone's writing new data to it and someone is still reading it, they just see like an old version, and uh, they don't have any uh, issues. Support for updates and deletes. Um, so yeah, with Parquet is immutable or ORC or Avro, it's immutable. So what you had to do with traditionally you had to get the file, change it, and then replace the file, which is recipe for disaster. It's object storage native. A lot of the old technologies are still from the Hadoop era. Um, Hadoop was really nice, but um, um, and one of the nice things that it had was like atomic renames and listing of directories. Uh, on the cloud storage, you don't have atomic renames. Listing is expensive, uh, so it's actually built for an object store in the first place. But it still works on HDFS. It's cross-engine compatible. Um, yeah, we see it every day. Like people are trying to lock you in. I don't like it. Most people don't like it. Uh, but it's also that you have different tools in your in your toolbox to work different issues, right? So if you want to do streaming, you want to use Flink. If you do uh, batch uh, ETL, you want to use Spark. If you want to do ad hoc queries, you want to use Trino. You want to have some flexibility in there. And Iceberg is very lazy, just like me. I'm a developer. You are developers. So for example, if you add like a column to a table, that is couple of petabytes, you don't want to rewrite the table. Uh, for Iceberg, there's just like a metadata operation, so it will just add like this table to it, um, sorry, add, it, add this column to it, to the table, um, and it's like an instant operation in 100 milliseconds. So all, this, all this, these nice features, right, they come at a, at a cost. Nothing is free. There's no free lunch, except today. Um, so um, yeah, let's, Lucas, what is the complexity? How does a query in Iceberg look like compared to uh, the traditional uh, ATFS query? So back in the days with MapReduce or also with Hive, uh, a table would be just like a, a list of files on an on a object store. Uh, what you would do is just like list all the parquet files, and that was your table. Each parquet file, you would see like how many uh, row groups are there, and that's your query planning, and then you know like how many tasks in Spark you have to kick off. With Hive, um, partitioning, you can make it a bit smart. You can say, okay, I'm going to partition the, um, the big table into smaller buckets, uh, which is very nice. So like event date is, uh, is the 1st of March. And then if you're looking for the data inside of March, you can only have to query like subdirectory of the whole table. But in Hive, hey, you actually had to explicitly uh, pass in that, uh, that column. So it's like partition by event date. Event time is then a format, a string format of the of the event time. Um, and also when you query it, you also have to pass in this, this in the predicate, which is kind of obvious if you're an engineer. But if you're an analyst, uh, you don't want to teach analysts to do this, right? So um, the query will run for a very long time because it essentially is doing like a full table scan. OK. How does it look like? First step, we say we want to uh, create the table in New York City taxis. We go to the catalog. At the catalog, we will find, if you're using the REST catalog, you get like the, J uh, the JSON directly. And if you use, the, for example, the Hive or the Glue or any other catalogs and many implementations that are compatible, uh, you get like a link to an S3 where the JSON resides. This is your first entry point of the, of the iceberg table. So in here, everything is defined at the Fahrenheit level, at the metadata level. So it will tell you, for example, what is the current schema, what are the, uh, the historical schemas. 
same for the partitioning, like uh, what's the partition column that's now uh, uh, today, and what are the historical partition columns. Um, Iceberg supports this notion of branching and tagging, same with, with code, but you can say like, okay, I want to tag like certain versions of the table with a sp specific tag, or I actually want to branch like from the main branch to do some operations. I can check like everything is okay, and I can actually merge that new version of the table into the main branch. Um, snapshots, the most important one. Uh, an iceberg table can have multiple snapshots, and it's often like true time, which is like a version of the table. In this case, you can see like there are six snapshots. I uh, collapse five of them, and the sixth one is open here. And you can actually see that it has like a link to the manifest list. And this is the, 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 the pathway to the actual data. It also contains some nice uh, uh, metadata. Sorry. So now we're going to the manifest list. And this actually, as the name suggests, uh, lists the manifest. In this case, there are two. One I've opened, one is collapsed. Um, this has a link to the actual manifest. It will tell you like, some information about uh, the operation. So in this case, 37 files were added. Um, we know the partitioning of the of the table. In this case, it's like um, on the date field, so it's like a, a lower and an upper bound. You can already use this like if you're doing query planning, right, to see if this one is relevant for you. And we have some more metadata, like how many rows were being added in this operation. Third and the last layer is the manifest itself. So uh, this contains what we call the manifest entries. It has like a link to the actual, in this case, parquet file. Also support ORC uh, and Avro. Um, it has, it's bucketed by the partition. So in this case, it will say like uh, pickup daytime is, and that's the number of days since uh, Epoch. And it has a lot of uh, what we call them metrics on the, each of the columns. So it tells you like the column sizes, number of values in the, in the columns, number of null values, none, and also per column like the upper and the lower bound. So if you do a query, you can actually already see like, okay, if this file is relevant for me, if it's not relevant, I can already skip it uh, because there's no data in there that will match my predicate. And also some more information about like split offsets of the, of the row groups. Small recap, so we had like the snapshots, which is like the, the different versions of the table two time that points to one manifest list that then points to one or multiple manifest, and then we go to the actual uh, data files, such as Parquet, Avro, ORC, um, and they're also there. Okay, let me just walk you through it, because this is like theory, so let's go to the practice uh, part. So this is like a, a notebook, it's also available in the link that you just saw, and you can just play around with Iceberg here if you want to get familiar with the concepts. Uh, so let's uh, spark this uh, Spark session. Let's create a database that doesn't exist. And then we're going to create a table, and we say, like, using Iceberg, and we say partition by, and then the days. So this is like what we call a transform of this column. So to actually truncate, like, the hours, the minutes, and the seconds from that column, and what we, what we call hidden partitioning. So uh, the partition column is not a column on its own. So, like, with Hive, you don't have to uh, add it to your predicate. So let's add some data there. The taxi data set, I think everyone here is familiar with it. You can actually see that Spark's already doing a shuffle because it has to shuffle like into the, into the partitions. So I have to partition it per day. And this is how the data set looks. So it's um, yeah, the typical data set that we use for testing. So at this point, we can see that the table has one snapshot. And that's like an append operation. And that's the one that we ju just did. And we can actually see already something fishy here, because this is the month of January. It has 31 days, I'm not mistaken, but here we can see this already has 40 precision, so there's some data quality issues here. Um, and if we would write like a second month of data, then we'd get like a, a second snapshot. And now we can see like, it's also an append operation. It, uh, it's the parent of this one. And it has like a new manifest list that we can take a look at. 
maybe good to mention in Spark, you have like all these helper. So New York City text is the actual table, but we have like to call like metadata data tables. Uh, dot files will tell you like all the data files. Dot manifest will tell you like all the manifest that are associated with that table. Yeah, so we have uh, two manifests. We have two snapshots that each point to one manif manifest list. And if you then list like all the manifests, so this is the union of all the data files in those two manifests. And we'll see the following. There's a lot of data here. So we see the actual parquet file. We see the, the partitioning. Uh, in this case is the, and which data is in there. Here we can see like the column sizes. Here we can see the number of values in there. Here we can see the, the null values, which is good. So there are no null values in here. And here we can see, oh, thank you, Apple. Here we can see the upper and the lower bound. So this will actually tell us on a column basis, like what is the upper and the lower bound. And this is also a helper. I'm not really good at decoding like binary. You can see like for improvement, surcharge is one of the columns. Uh, the column size is 94. There's 21 column. Uh, values. There's no nulls, no nonce. Lower bound is 0 0.3, and the upper bound is also 0 0.3. So if you try to query on this, it will actually use the statistics to optimize the query in a query planning time. It's very hard to think upfront, right, from partitions. And if you try to repartition like a very big table, it can be very expensive, right? Um, so if you now look at the partitions, we can see like um, that each of the files is like a daily partition. But if you say like, okay, let's drop this daily partition, let's add like a new hourly partition, and we look at the partitions, and we can see that nothing has changed. And that's because it's, it's la lazy. So what we actually do is call the procedure, it's called rewrite data files. And what it will do, it will actually look at that uh, the partitioning has been changed, take all the data and repartition it. Um, and also, if you have a lot of if you append like data to existing partitions, you get like a lot of small files. These procedures will also compact these files. So in this case, we can see we had, had, have read like uh, 86 files and almost written like 1,500 files because we went from a lower granularity, went from days to hours. And then we can see that actually has like the new, uh, like the number of hours from APOG. If we then look at the snapshots, then we can also see what we expect. So in this case, operation was a replace operation because we took like all the data from the table, we rewrote it, and we create like a new uh, manifest list. So uh, we actually replaced like the table. So there we could now clean up like the older versions of the table if we know that nobody is reading them. So what we just see like. Using the statistics, both on partitioning but also on the column levels, we can do multiple levels of pruning. Uh, during query planning, we can only exclude like a lot of the stuff that we're not interested in, that's not relevant. And this, this way, we can uh, we have to process like uh, fewer tasks. Also, have to make like fewer calls to S3, so that's also going to save you both um, um, like uh, query time because I think it will go faster, but also uh, less cost because also. All these uh, calls have to be paid, of course. And there's no listing or renaming of the whole, uh, uh, in the whole uh, process. So I spent a lot of the last year a lot of work on implementing all of this in, uh, in Python. So I definitely want to plug this here. Uh, so PyIceberg actually implements like yeah, this whole uh, specification of Iceberg as well. Uh, fully open source, also part of the Iceberg project itself. So let me uh, give you a quick show. So let me skip this because it's actually loading data. And what you can see here is that we load like the catalog that points to the REST catalog that comes with the setup. We say like the New York City taxis, that's the same table that we just uh, worked with. And we say then pickup time is larger than. 1st of January of 2021, and it will also do the pruning and st stuff. And then we will actually get like a, a, an arrow data frame. By Iceberg, uh, we didn't want to like re-implement everything, so we didn't want to build like uh, parquet readers and all the, all the stuff that's already very good provided by Arrow and 
pandas and polars and all these libraries that we have in the Python world. So it's only doing like the metadata stuff there. And you can see the, the data itself. And then it's very easy to make some, uh, uh, some columns out of there. So here you can see that's also very skewed. I'm hoping that nobody paid like 400k for a taxi ride. And we can do the nice statistics there. And also because it's in, uh, it's in Pyero, we can also just easily use it in, uh, um, in DuckDB. Uh, so this is like a way of plotting uh, data in DuckDB. With, du with the Jupyter Notebook in integration, you have to cre first create like the SQL statement and then you can plot it because you can use the same query to plot like use it in different plots. And then we can see like the tip amount is centered around like two dollars. You actually have negative tips in the, the first chart. It looked like it was negative tip. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, <laughs> I think that's the charting. Uh, I hope. Data quality issues here, <laughs> but that's nice, right? You can just remove them or uh, without anyone noticing. Yeah. <laughs> so a bit looking ahead, uh, what's next? So working on uh, the community is working on the multi-table transactions, which is quite exciting. So and now we can do asset operations on one table, but if you have multiple tables that have and are joining to each other, you want to have like referential integrity. Uh, so uh, multi-table transactions will allow you to, um, for example, do a commit, add files to multiple tables in one atomic operation. View support. A lot of engines already support views, but the iceberg views will be actually uh, across engines. So if you define one view, you can use the same view, for example, in Snowflake, in Spark, um, any uh, iceberg compatible uh, engine. And we're working hard on the ice Pi Iceberg 0.4 release, uh, which has support for positional deletes, uh, which is um, Rewriting parquet files are quite expensive, so what you can do is positional leads. You say, like, from the parquet file, position 0 0.1 and 8 are considered the lead, and then it will actually uh, uh, remove those from the result. Column metrics that I just showed, a lot of performance improvements, also from the uh, Arrow uh, library itself. We removed like a lot, a couple of calls to S3 there, which is really cool, and a complete makeover of the documentation. Always very happy that people also spend time time on documentation, a lot of effort from the community in here as well. So I'm very thankful for the community there. And that concludes my talk. So I hope that you now feel comfortable with the basic concepts of Iceberg. So what is a manifest file? What is, a, what is the metadata? And I just want to make sure that it's just a tip. Um, we also do a lot of smart stuff there with deletes. And so and the file pruning that you just saw. Also, if you have delete files that are not relevant for the, for the query that you're running, we also prune them. So that actually makes Iceberg to have quite efficient deletes. The Puffin index, uh, it's a new format that allows you to uh, ship um, indexes together with, with uh, uh, the actual data files. Uh, for example, if you want to have like a bitmap index, you can put them in the, the Puffin uh, file. You can actually use this to speed up your queries. Things like time travel. Uh, as you can see with the snapshots, you can go through time, but it's also much more complicated than that, and also the support for branching and tagging. Uh, yeah, that's all in there. I think that's it uh, for now. Thank you. Th thanks, Foucault. Uh, I'll ask for more questions, but the first question, like, how do you do time travel? I'm really interested in time traveling. You know, I need more hair and stuff like yeah. that. So. <laughs> no, jo joking. Uh, questions, please. Uh, thanks, Foko. Uh, I'm Dennis, and um, I have a question about data quality. 
uh, iceberg exposes uh, rich metadata tables with lots of statistics and so on. So it looks like uh, it will be a good idea to run some data quality checks on top of these metadata tables instead of like great expectation or other data quality solutions. So is there any existing approach uh, to handle this problem for data quality on top of metadata uh, table in iceberg or is there a space to create it, yeah. some tool on top of it? Thanks. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so a lot of this metadata is actually being already used by the, uh, when you do a query. For, for example, if you say is null, then we'll always keep like all the data files where there are no null values for that specific column. Um, so in this, in the future, this also will, if you do like a max on a specific column, it'll actually use the metadata and not the data itself. I'm not sure like which engine that nowadays implement this, but it's definitely something that's in the pipeline. Before the next question, maybe a follow-up on that one, because I'm, I'm really interested. Because we are adding the open lineage uh, support to as a kind of core feature of Apache Airflow. Is that something that Ap uh, Iceberg could uh, consider as well, to expose the data with uh, the metadata, the quality, uh, the, the metadata of lineage uh, uh, via open lineage? Because yeah. that's, that, that would be really cool. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great opportunity, yeah. And I think lineage is always like, I could think that could be a talk on its own, like what are you gonna include into the lineage, like data lineage or job lineage, and, but uh, that's something that's definitely, uh, it could be added, yeah. Thanks. Uh, that might be a stupid question, maybe I missed it, but is, uh, is the iceberg format suitable for transactional processing where you have deletes and updates with a high frequency? Uh, good question. Uh, so it's fully asset compliant. So it, it supports like this notion of transactions. It's also isolated and safe. Uh, but it's not built for like very high transaction rates uh, because everything lives inside of a S3 bucket. And the calls to S3 buckets are and they're remote, so they take a bit of, of time. And especially if you, if you have very big jobs. So let's say you start rewriting like a whole table, another job just started there. Um, it depends like who finished first. Um, the one that finished first does like a successful commit, and the one that that is, is is last, right? It tries to see if the if you can still apply the changes of the work. If that's possible, it will actually like commit it on the top of the new version. If that's not possible, then it will just say like commit failed. Please try again. So it's it's you always have to take this into account. So for example, um, if you have like a CDC job that continues to append data to the table. Uh, and you want to do compaction because the CDC job um, does like a lot of uh, small files, creates a lot of small files. You actually want to make sure that you follow behind that uh, a bit so you don't have any overlap between your jobs. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about uh, this, what you mentioned with the optimization with pruning. Uh, when I have a Spark job and I have an execution plan in a Spark job and then later I come to Iceberg, uh, how, how does I have to imagine it? Uh, it just skips the data or uh, does it optimize the execution plan or how does it look like? Yeah, so it actually uses all this metric at query planning. So you provide like a query, you say like select from, uh, and like I just did, and you say like tip amount is zero, then smaller than, than zero. Um, what, I, what Spark will do, it will actually look at, okay, this table will get like the manifest, manifest list, and then look at all the manifests and look like, okay, if the lower bound of the, of the tip amount column is zero, then I know like there are no negative values in there. So then I actually just can skip this parquet file. And this way, you only end up like with the parquet files that actually contain like negative values in this sense. So, and yeah, using this, you can actually skip a lot of the actual reading of the parquet, which is heavy lifting. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a list, another question, sorry, sorry, a very short one, but um, and I have heard about two other formats like Hootie and Delta Lake. How would you see Iceberg in comparison to these two formats? <laughs> <laughs> I was not sure, like, if we're gonna do this talk or that talk. <laughs> No, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so they, it's, it's a very big answer. So I think the strong points of Iceberg are like, it has like very broad compatibility with a lot of engines. The whole, uh, uh, everything is community driven and we see like a lot of engagement there. So um, 
yeah, I don't feel like this is the position to just uh, throw it out there like in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and and it has the governance of Apache Software Foundation as well. Yeah, yeah. it's an yeah. Apache project. Yeah, Hoodie is also an Apache uh, project, mm -hmm. uh, and Delta is then in the Linux Foundation uh, Software Foundation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, how does Iceberg deal with uh, partition size optimization? So normally, if you're running in, in S3, you have the sweet spot of a couple of hundred megabytes where you would want a single partition to be for queries in Parquet being at their most efficient. And if you're automating many big tables, you do not want to optimize every table manually, but ideally have that framework do it for you at least. That's, that, that for us is one of the big benefits of uh, yeah, switching to these formats. Um, what does Iceberg do under the hood or like how, uh, how uh, would that interface look like? Yeah, very good question. So Iceberg does, has like a silver bullet to this, right? But it provides like the capabilities to optimize this, this for you. So for example, um, um, when it comes to partitions, with Iceberg, you can have as many partitions as you want. Uh, it can be thousands, right? And these partitions actually de define the granularity of your data. So for example, when I went from daily to hourly, I get like much smaller files, which at this scale, because these tables are 100 megabytes, is probably far too small, right? Also, when on an hourly, it's also probably too small. Uh, on a daily, of a, yeah, on a daily partitioning, is probably also too small. Ideally, you want to have your parquet files to be nice and big. And you can do all kinds of optimizations on top of it, right? So if you sort, sort your data in like a particular order, uh, then it can be that your parquet file is like 30% smaller because it compresses much better. In general, you want your, have your parquet files to be as big as possible uh, because, for example, Spark, it will just split it up like in the, in the row groups uh, and you can actually potentially also do some pruning there. Um, and what Iceberg does, it's you can just rewrite the data, right? So you can, if you have, a lot of small files, or you want to, you say like, okay, for, for the new data, I want to have like a, a, this level of compression, and for the old data, that's like an archive. I want to have like a higher compression. There's all things that you can do very easily with Iceberg transparently. Does, does that answer the question? Awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, my question was more like in, uh, is, is there is there a way to um, like do that thing? Yeah, I don't know. Automatically in the background that you do not have to make that decision for every single table. Because yeah. I mean, we have thousands of tables, and I do not want to make that decision for every single table. Uh, yeah. I agree, and that's why we started Tabular actually. So the company where I work. So if you're interested, uh, <laughs> please talk afterwards. <laughs> Very good answer. Uh, I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. The uh, question from the online audience. Let's give them a chance a little bit. Uh, if something like ClickHouse does not support ACID, can it still be an implementation for Iceberg? They seem similar from what I have seen in the previous presentation. ClickHouse. Yeah. yeah I would say I, <laughs> look, <laughs> I, I would say it, it can, right? So I think there are multiple levels of integration. You could say like read integration, right? That's that should be possible. I think easy and then you can think about like write integration that's always a bit more challenging but because you have to get all the mechanics right uh, but yeah why not I think it should fit hi great talk I also agree it's the one true format um, <laughs> but so, and the use of the manifest list is what gives you transaction and concurrency and control of reads yes and time travel so we get so essentially, the more manifest lists you have, the better your time travel is. But once you compact the database, you lose your time travel. But if you don't compact the database, your queries get slower and slower and slower, right? Yes. So if you, for example, with the CDC case, you append a lot of data. And at some point, you have to do like, um, and it, it's just like awesome procedure that comes with uh, Iceberg open source. You have to re-clean up like this history. So at some point, we actually want to prune like the... Uh, and the snapshots. And you can say, like, okay, well, the prune snapshots older than 
uh, six weeks, for example. Um, yeah, and, and the performance penalty that, that we're seeing like is that manifest JSON, uh, the JSON file that you saw in the beginning, if you have like thousands of snapshots, the thing gets, gets huge, right? And then you, uh, yeah, it takes a lot of processing power to actually parse this thing. Uh, so at some point you actually want to yeah, do the cleaning up there. Otherwise you accumulate also a lot of data on S3. Uh, you want to have the capability to do some try and travel there, but you also have to make sure that um, that you don't store like infinite uh, amounts of information. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Um, will all the, with all these uh, time travels and snapshotting, uh, is it possible to use uh, Iceberg for GDPR compliance? Like, are we can, can we make sure that the data we want to delete for personal data are actually deleted everywhere? Good question. Yeah, I think this also ties into the previous question. So, snapshots are con considered immutable. So, if you have a snapshot uh, and you and you change data from it, you create like a new snapshot. The old snapshot is immutable and stays there. So, if you do a GDPR, you can very easily clean up like an old version of the data. But then you have to make sure that you expire this old snapshot because that still has references to the to the old data that contains like the PAI data. Uh, so, I think Iceberg is very nice to actually do this and this transaction. Uh, jobs are still reading like the old data. You clean up like the PII data that's in there, create like a new snapshot in there. You give it some time for all the jobs to finish, and when they start reading like the, the table again, they will automatically pick like the latest version of the table, the latest snapshot, and then you can actually remove like the old data there. You say expire snapshots, and it will actually remove like uh, the manifest list, the manifest, and also the actual data that contains PII. Just wondering, do you have any mechanism to prevent reading raw data? Sorry? Do you have any mechanism to prevent people using raw data? I mean, not for the iceberg. I still, still don't understand. So the scenario is, you know, you would like to delete with the help of iceberg some personal data, and then someone runs the Spark job without declaring a Spark uh, iceberg extension. Oh yeah, that's not possible, no. Now, because, for example, if you have a, if a partition and you rewrite the data, the parquet files land in the same directory. So then, without the metadata, you would not know like which is the old version and which is the new version. So, yeah, that's very tricky. What you could do is like expire the old data directly, but yeah, then you don't have the asset guarantees anymore, because there's some point in time that's a multiple versions of of the data in that uh, directory. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. Like, suggesting is to disable like listing of the of the data. So when you use a native Spark or whatever that doesn't support like Iceberg, you try to list like the directory to see like which files are in there. If you disable that on AZFS or S3, then we'll get like a not allowed, forbidden. Uh, and with Iceberg, you only have like eh, you only uh, do a get request to the actual data. So then that will still work. That's a very nice suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. One quick question from me, if I may. The, how does it compare to what Snowflake offers? Because th that, everything that you talk about, like time travel, snapshotting, and like storing files, in, it's, it's very similar. So yeah. was that a kind of inspiration or...? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a bigger effort that's going on for quite a bit of time. Uh, Snowflake actually supports like Iceberg, so you could actually create like Iceberg tables from Snowflake. That's all supported. Uh, I think Iceberg... What it tries to do is like to be outside of a query engine. Uh, also, Tabular doesn't provide, provide any query engine, so it's, it's just only the table format. Uh, and this way, you can still use Snowflake, for example, if analytics or uh, these kind of workloads, but still also use Spark for doing ETL. Yeah. OK, uh, last more quick question. So it seems like there are uh, a few dimensions alongside which uh, performance can be improved. So one is partitioning, uh, the other would be your, the min-max indexes that you're talking about, right? So what about when your data set has multi multiple dimensions? So let's say, uh, and, uh, I face this problem. So you have trillions of rows uh, with uh, high cardinality across uh, numerous columns. 
so you, you are kind of limited in how much you can prune, even uh, within a single partition uh, with too many parquet files, even yeah. with, when they are like very well compressed, or very tightly packed. Yeah. So how can you optimize that even further, or like how can you skip? So one way is to, like I said already, is like sort the data into a specific column, so you actually match like the access pattern of the table. And if you want to go in extreme, then you could also say, for example, um, uh, partitioning. We also have, for example, bucket partitioning. So then you say, like, you have a specific value, do a hash on it, and it lands in a specific bucket. So you can actually, for example, a user ID column, you can split it into multiple buckets. So you still uh, uh, yeah, can have some sharding there. And if you want to go to the far extreme, then, for example, with the Puffin format, you could also implement your own indexes. But that's then you really have to have a very specific use case. Right. That time is out. Thank you very much. Uh, for Thank talk. you all.